My name is Lois Hall. I'm from Henning Larson. Um, I'm part of the New York studio. Um, really excited to be here and partake in this amazing workshop. I'd like to give special thanks to the Boston Valley team, John Cross, Andrew, Andy Brayman, Mike Patterson. I feel like I'm missing somebody, Sanjeev. Um, it just has been a tremendous experience for us and really appreciative of all the knowledge that you shared with us uh, every week and you know, kind of being patient with us. Uh, just us being first time participating, we had a lot of questions you know, and we were really trying hard to push the boundaries of architectural terracotta, so uh, thank you. Um, I would also like to introduce our team. Um, Again, I'm Lois uh, from Henning Larson's New York studio. Uh, Chris Dial and uh, Daniel Bauman from our office were part of the team. Um, I also have Josephine and Vish from Thornton Tomasetti. They provided their facade expertise on this project. And uh, Joel Cascilla from Innovation Glass who advised on and provided generously um, our curtain wall system. So um, I wanted to start out with this first slide um, because uh, more than, you know, for several decades, uh, our species have been living beyond our means, you know, creating a lot of um, waste along the way. And um, this has had a really a huge impact on uh, our climate and, and, and our planet. And I think it's, um, I'm, I don't think I'm, um, exaggerating to say that we're in this planetary crisis on uh, depleting resources. And I'm sure many of you in this room may know this already, but uh, construction and building industry as a whole were, you know, were contributing significantly to the carbon em emission every year globally. Um, looking at just the construction material alone, is it moving on? No. There you go. Just looking at construction material alone, um, it's contributing over 11% uh, of the overall carbon emissions. So it's, it's really not small. And this has a huge impact on our environment, our nature. Um, as we speak, over a million species are at risk of extinction. And at Henning Larson, and obviously we're known for our design excellence, but we have a deep commitment for sustainability, and we really take all of these issues very seriously on our projects, really under, trying to understand and educate ourselves on carbon, and also promoting biodiversity and using materials that are responsible and, and, and bio-based. So, uh, and also we, you know, we do this through our projects and, and through our, a lot of research that we do. Uh, we have a dedicated research department in our office that, you know, look at this in many different aspects and try to apply and create these tools that can be used in our project and really give us real data as we design our buildings and environments. Um, and we also share our knowledge. We love to share our knowledge through these publications uh, so that we can educate ourselves, we can educate our stakeholders and clients and ourselves. Um, so as we embarked on this workshop, um, we were really interested in creating something beautiful, obviously, but also something that really is in line with uh, this commitment to sustainability. Um, this is a project that we did in Copenhagen. It's a, a green wall system that we designed for a office building. Uh, and, you know, as I wasn't part of this project, but we learned a lot of lessons through this. And, you know, green wall is amazing. It uh, offsets a lot of carbon. It's beautiful. Um, but also, it takes a lot of heavy engineering and a lot of maintenance. So uh, as we started this project, um, we looked at moss. And you might ask why moss? Uh, I think one of the biggest reasons is because it just covers everywhere. 3% um, of the earth is covered by moth. And this is the map of the world that's covered by moth. And moss, and there are you know, over 12,000 different species that really kind of thrive in many different environments. You know, I think we typically think that they grow in the shade. You know, they can only survive in a very wet environment, but really there are many different species that can do a lot of different things and adapt to different locations. 
And it comes with many benefits, um, I think, uh, because unlike any other plants, it doesn't have roots. It has these very fine filaments that could really just tack onto any sort of uh, substrate or surface that has microscopic uh, porosity. Um, that means it requires no soil. And as we all know, it typically grows on you know, terracotta roof tiles, brick walls, it grows on rock formations. Um, and because it doesn't require soil, um, it means very little maintenance. You know, you don't have to deal with a lot of the freestyle issues that you have in building systems. Um, and it also just provides really good soundproofing in an urban environment, whether that's um, outside or inside. Um, also has incredible water retention properties, and it also provides all these kind of microscopic um, habitats for different um, type of species. So just to give uh, you a little bit of perspective of, of, on what that means, and, and this is really regarding um, one of the thing, one of the benefits that I really wanted to focus on this project uh, is, the, is that the moss really provides a, a huge um, benefit for carbon sequestration. So uh, to give that to a scale, uh, roughly 10, 10 square feet of moss can absorb more carbon than a typical mature tree. And then it also, um, that, that also means that over a million square feet of active moss surfaces in cities can clean the air for 500 million people and reduce 100 million tons of carbon emissions by 2030. So to give that a little bit of perspective, you know, in North America, US, Canada combined, we have about 350 million people. So that's a pretty significant number. Um, but on top of this huge benefit on carbon offset uh, property, I think it, you know, it also provides air filtration. Um, also just going back to the carbon, it, um, basically if you have a small moss lawn that can offset more carbon than having all these trees. Um, and then as I mentioned before, it can retain up to 10 times more uh, weight of its uh, 10 times more weight of water than itself, which is also a huge property. So those are kind of the, the initial research that we started out with. And um, as we started into kind of the thinking about, you know, what kind of system we're going to design, we started out and uh, with this concept of moss growing in, on any type of uh, substrate. And we were really inspired by some of these images that we were finding, uh, especially kind of the, the way moss can kind of um, take over certain uh, surfaces, these textural qualities, especially on rock formation. And we took that idea and had a little bit of fun with AI. Um, we took <laughs> Uh, we took some of these kind of conceptual uh, textural prompts to Midjourney and played around and came up with a lot of these kind of crazy inspirational images. Um, and, and initially, um, you know, they were kind of more on the wild side, but we were kind of, we, as we got used to the software, you know, we were kind of really able to narrow it down to some of the textural and topographical qualities that we wanted to express on terracotta. So these are some of the, from the earlier iterations to the later ones. And we were thinking that and then eventually we wanted to create these kind of tile system that had these qualities and would allow moss to grow on different you know, valleys and peaks of the surfaces and also have certain level of porosity. But from there, you know, it, it took us a little bit of time to figure out you know, how do we actually you know, come up with a prototype and visualize this. And these are, again, some of those earlier uh, explorations that we have done. Um, but one thing that uh, we tried in the beginning with these images that we created out of Midjourney, uh, and the challenge of that was really being able to control all the different dimensions and the precision you need for a material like terracotta. So we took it to Rhino, you know, played around with the texture mapping a little bit, but it wasn't really quite getting um, the precision that we needed. Uh, so we kind of went back and started hand sketching, you know, what is the overall idea? And it was really about kind of creating this uh, field of gradient and the, with different textural qualities, whether that came from the formal expression or the type of glaze. 
Um, so then we tried different modeling techniques. It was starting to get really rigid and kind of away from our original intent to make this really read like a gradient field. So we tried subtle modeling and that was kind of getting close to where we really wanted to be in terms of you know, being able to control the form and control all the different tolerances. So these are some of those earlier explore explorations. And working closely with Boston Valley, you know, we, you know, we were you know, going back and forth a lot about different tolerances. How is this going to be cast? Um, you know, can we have double curves? You know, undercuts? You know, dimensions, thickness of the tile? All these really great um, conversations and explorations. And we basically landed on this kind of initial um, typical module, a 12 by 30 inch tile with four different types kind of going from very simple striation all the way to uh, getting more deeper with more prosody and undulation. And this was really kind of uh, our, our intent to give a different variety of um, uh, topographical surfaces for the moss to grow. And our intent was really not to, you know, kind of let moss, I mean, nature does that, it just kind of takes over everything eventually, but we also wanted to um, make it intentional and think about how moss will be grown on this tile. So um, that also is related to how we kind of came up with this form and uh, also um, the glaze exploration. And uh, these are some of the kind of um, learnings that uh, we had back and forth with Boston Valley, thinking about you know, the, the tool path, the size of the uh, tool bits, and you know, how that was also creating this kind of another layer of textural quality on our tiles. And then we also did some 3D test prints to understand the scale of the, the world tile, but also the depth. You know, we were really trying to create these uh, certain level of depth within the parameter that we have with the terracotta tile so that moss can have a certain level of horizontal surface that they can really tack onto for initial growth. And also the porosity was related to kind of really thinking about the overall facade system and one, our desire to make this to be kind of double-sided skin with both front and back being able to um, viewed. So this is kind of our later rendition of the typical tiles. And then uh, and our initial um, thought on how the moss will start to grow basically within these kind of pinched shelves and then uh, later into these uh, holes and take over the back side of the tile. Um, when it came to the glaze, uh, gla glaze studies, um, we worked closely with Andy Brayman and you know, basically asked him to send us all the different glaze samples that he has in his pocket. Um, and as, when that shipment arrived and uh, we opened the box and saw these uh, crackle glazes, we were really um, drawn to it, um, partly because of uh, just the formal quality, you know, that's related to our, you know, tile modules, but also that extra microscopic texture it was creating uh, for these crevices and, and, and where moss can grow. So uh, we thought about then how do we apply this, you know, do we leave the entire tile unglazed? Um, we also learned that unglazed terracotta is still, it's a full, full on product and it's, it's um, not weaker in any sense. So. You know, we started out with that and then thought about then do we kind of take over this beautiful crackle glaze and you know, glaze the entire thing. And then we kind of came down to this kind of happy medium, creating again another layer of gradient through glaze, uh, allowing those, um, basically this was a directional spray so that given the geometry of our tile, all those flat and, and kind of higher points of peaks would be uh, caught on glaze and then it would leave all the valleys um, within the form unglazed. So, and that was our way of controlling where the moss would start growing. And really formally work with, you know, um, the glazed areas and, and moss really almost becoming that second layer of material on the tile. So here are some close-ups from uh, uh, two days ago, uh, we actually did not really see how this was going to turn out until we got here on Monday and we were quite excited about how it really um, came together. 
uh, we really appreciate all the different gradient that uh, that directional glaze um, application created, you know, going from very crackle to kind of more smoother white glazed surface to this unglazed um, valleys. We also learned um, that depending on the layer, the, the amount of layer you apply on the, uh, of this um, crackle glaze, you know, you can get this really fine, uh, more smaller scale crackle versus kind of this more wild, um, bigger scale crackle. And some of this was actually, you know, creating this peeling off from the clay body, which we, we didn't expect, but um, I think this is kind of one of those lessons learned uh, moving on. And I think uh, it'd be really exciting for us to study uh, this glaze, this type particular type of glaze a little bit more with Andy. Uh, we also learned uh, actually uh, during this process that this type of crackle glaze has a secret ingredient, which I don't think I'm, not, I'm allowed to reveal. But we were very happy to hear that it actually comes from a post-industrial recycle content. And that was really interesting to learn. Um, but moving on, um, I think working with those four typical modules, we played around and started thinking about, you know, how does this apply to architecture and what kind of facade system does it become? You know, how do these tiles modulate and create a certain pattern? Um, and we started thinking about this as really as a double skin uh, system uh, in front of a curtain wall, really acting as a screen wall. Um, and then this, you're kind of seeing the back side of the tile as if you're inside the building, looking through the glass. And we really thought the back side of the tile was just as important. And we left it unglazed. And, and we were hoping that over the years, the, the initial moss that are transplanted on, on, on the front of the tile would eventually to start taking over on the back side because it actually has more shade and it could be optimal for certain species of moss. Um, but with that, I'm going to give the mic to Josephine to talk about how we, uh, the process through how we designed the overall facade system. Hi, I'm Josephine, and as mentioned by Lois Fish and I from London Thomas City, we're brought on as facade consultants for this project to look at how the structural support system might be developed. Um, so, due to Henning Larson's interest in creating a porous panel, um, we wanted to consider the best way to display it, and initially we actually looked at both ideas of a traditional rain screen and also projecting outward from a curtain wall system, and as noted, the curtain wall and rain screen system was considered preferable for, for displaying the form from both sides and also exploiting the fact that we have a porous panel that was going to allow light to filter into a building interior. Um, other in concerns that informed the design of the panels were looking at minimizing the support structure so it's not going to obstruct the view of the panels, and also developing the connection design so that um, it's not going to interfere with the open joints of the rain screen outboard of the curtain wall. Um, additionally, we were working with terracotta, a brittle material, so we were also interested in preventing any movements imposed from external forces from being um, uh, imposed on the terracotta panels themselves. Um, So that was the direction that we went in, and in doing that, we started to look at several precedents that informed how we might achieve this. So the first of those was the NYU Global Center for Academic and Spiritual Life. So this system did something similar to what we wanted to achieve. This is a laminated stone panel system outboard of a glazed curtain wall. Um, and it's essentially clipped back at the mullion, so it didn't quite have the level of projection that we wanted to get, but it was achieving a similar effect. Then we also looked at the Novartis uh, Institute for Biomedical Research. This was closer to what we were aiming for. Um, so we're looking at a very minimized support structure. And also, again, it's supporting a, a very brittle type rain screen outboard of the main curtain wall. We also looked at a previous Thornton Tomasetti project, the University of Oregon Knight Campus building, which is actually a glass rain screen. And 
this also achieved a very minimal support structure outboard of the main curtain wall system. And we looked at the strategy um, that was developed for this particular project, which was dead loading the secondary skin from the top of the building so that you would only have lateral pinbacks on the way down the building um, to the lower levels. And this was able to reduce the amount of material that's used on each level for the tied backs. Um, so we really started with that as a bit of a springboard for our conceptual design. And uh, a lot of our early concepts looked at achieving something similar by using a pinned, uh, pinned connection structure with a lot of diagonal braces. And we also looked in the other direction of increasing the rigidity and the structural members and joints and using basically less components. And ultimately, we ended up with uh, something of a hybrid of those two approaches. So the other aspect of designing the structure was managing the interface between the terracotta panels and the support system. So as noted, we wanted to keep the joints open and not expose any hardware to um, obscure the panel uh, interfaces. And um, so our early concepts, we actually had two components to connect back to the support structure to manage the horizontal and vertical tolerances. Uh, between the panel and the system, which you know had, had to do with not inducing any movement into that panel. Um, and ultimately this was condensed into one component that managed uh, horizontal and vertical movement at the panel and vertical support component respectively. So you can see at the top we have an early concept um, with, I guess, an idealized, minimized clip, which is ultimately what we would like to aim for. Then below that, we have a concept um, developed by Boston Valley that looked at reducing the number of clips um, by sharing clips between panels, which that idea, uh, we moved past it because it was interfered with the panel joints. And again, we ended up finally with something that was somewhat in between these two concepts. And we can also see in the top um, image another parameter that we were working with, which is um, the failure cone offset for the anchor into the terracotta panel. So there were certain zones we could and couldn't install anchors due to the brittle nature of the terracotta and how it might fail. So like I mentioned, our final design was somewhere in between the two approaches of a pinned brace structure and a uh, rich environment joint structure. So we focused on using fewer and more rigid components, but we maintained a few diagonal brace components for um, out of plane movements. Um, and we conceptualized this as hanging from a slab edge. And we wanted to show uh, for the hypothetical building, what a top dead load hanging connection would look like, and also what a lateral pin back connection would look like, which you can see as the more delicate structure um, in the image there and also on the final model. Um, so to realize this final model, um, we had to build a curtain wall behind our panels, and to do that, we had to bring a curtain wall fabricator on board. So that was where Innovation Glass stepped in and our uh, load path actually got flipped on its head at that point because for the purposes of the mock-up, they suggested creating vertical cantilevers for the Malians and actually base loading them instead of hanging them because this would avoid creating an additional structure to hang our structure from. But we wanted to maintain um, the language of the dead load support at the top and the lateral tie back to demonstrate what this may look like in an actual building situation. Um, and several things that we learned in building the model was that um, we would like to develop the connection aesthetic further in future and we wanted to put some more thought into seeing the panel as a double-sided object. Um, and additionally, developing structural techniques for increasing the porosity. And another thought we had was, how might we turn this into a unitized system? Um, going back to the carbon metric and understanding how much carbon uh, our system is um, contributing, uh, we looked at uh, 
the different types of moss species, did a lot of research on moss. Uh, I'm not a landscape designer, and this was a really interesting uh, exploration. Um, tapped into a lot of different experts and eventually uh, got some comments from uh, certain folks um, and were able to narrow down the species uh, of moss that we wanted to plant on this uh, system by basically uh, coming up with a certain mix of moss that would uh, do well in different types of environment in terms of humidity, humidity level, um, amount of daylight, um, and also the growth pattern. Certain um, moss grow upright, uh, other ones grow in sideways, and for this type of vertical application, we were advised to use more of the side-growing um, moss species. And also thinking about being in the east coast, east coast of North America, you know, what kind of species would do well in this environment, especially in a very dry winter climate. Um, and then we also uh, took some samples of growth rate from the species and uh, tried to understand how fast um, the moss will grow on these tiles and you know, what that means in terms of um, the overall carbon sequestration. Uh, let me see if I can play this little video of uh, moss taking over the tile. But we're basically assuming, uh, so we have two prototypes here. That together they make up about 60 square feet. And we started out assuming about 10% coverage of moss. And uh, at year zero, that's six square feet of moss. But uh, by year 25, it'll, it'll be more than 80 square feet of moss. And that means that on year zero, that actually um, sequesters and uh, sequesters about one kilogram of carbon. And as that uh, growth rate, uh, as the growth of, growth of moss takes over the tile and the amount of moss increasing, increases, basically it uh, you know, increases the amount of carbon uh, it sequesters. It, seem, it may seem like a small amount, but um, you know, if you really apply that into a building uh, scale, for example, if you covered every facade surface of Empire State Building, you would be offsetting about 282 ton of carbon, and that's equivalent to about 300 flights from Frankfurt to New York City. Um, to put that in perspective again, um, one ton of carbon is equivalent to about 3,000 kilometers with a patrol car. A flight from Frankfurt to New York, uh, about that amount of uh, bottles of Coke and a balloon with a diameter of 30 feet. And um, as a conclusion, uh, even 0.01% of the US commercial buildings' facades, uh, if that amount of facades are covered by moss, you know, would be sequestering 17, almost 18,000 tons of carbon every year. And that's a huge contribution. So we arrived here on Monday, and we were super excited to be uh, installing this. This was actually our first time seeing. We haven't gotten a single photo of this tile before we got here, so we were really nervous. Um, but uh, we're really, really happy how it all turned out together. Um, uh, one thing that Christine mentioned uh, during her lecture, and I think ZGF group also mentioned this too, but she, she said, you know, designing ter with terracotta, terracotta is not just about designing surface, but it's about designing experience, and I thought that really resonated with um, our design process at Henning Larson. And we always talk about how a building should be experienced from many different scales. You know, you really uh, experience it at a larger scale when you're looking at the overall building. But as you walk towards closer to the building and really experience the smaller scale at the ground level, uh, the relationship to the ground plane, and also just all the different textures that come from the materiality is really important to us. And that's really re what we wanted to uh, resonate in this design. And we thought it was really be uh, beautifully achieved. Um, you know, the formal expression and, and the way the glaze work with that form, it, just, it was really um, perfect. So some additional images here. I think depending on the different light qualities, we were quite happy with you know, how that affect and, and reading of the tiles uh, together as a whole and also just individual close-ups. We just really felt like there were many different scales of experience that, that we had intended. And also, you know, just technically, you know, the way you know, we were also nervous, <laughs> not being 
a moss expert, you know, whether moss is going to actually, you know, be happy transplanting on these surfaces. But, you know, the overall scale of the tile and I think the qual textural quality really just worked out and, you know, we're quite happy how moss is staying on and hopefully grow over the years um, and also take over through these kind of porosity and openings in the tile and take over the backside of the tile. That's kind of, that was kind of, you know, thinking that we had because, you know, it's really viewed from outside as a building, but also from inside, you know, looking through the curtain wall. So we thought that was really important too. And, you know, it's really creating this um, habitat for many different types of species too. So in, I think many levels we thought conceptually and final result, uh, we're very happy how it turned out and we're counting on Boston Valley to uh, keep the moth growth, moss growth and, and, and hopefully keep this in an optimal humidity level so that we can really see the <laughs> <laughs> um, moth growth take over. Um, lessons learned and next steps. Uh, it was a tremendous uh, experience for us. I think there's a lot to be learned about a building material. You know, when you really, when you're not just designing on paper, but really coming here to build everything together. Um, I think some of the things that we really want to tackle uh, when there's an opportunity next is again the attachment system, especially from the inside. I think we were focused so much on making sure that it's not visible from outside. Uh, but when you're look, looking through the curtain wall system, you know you actually see a lot of it. So that's something that we wanted to kind of explore next. Also, putting the prototype together, we learned about tolerances and the shrinkage and, and all that within the tile. Um, and we may rethink about you know, whether going with open joints was the right decision and may explore other options. Clay, by, clay body and glaze is something that we really wish we had more time to explore with Boston Valley. There are so many different um, ways to do this and um, you know, given the time constraint, we really didn't get to and we were just happy that it turned out great. But something that we like to you know, really understand you know, in terms of you know, how we can control you know, that scale of crackle and also you know, what type of color you start out with on the clay body. Um, and then uh, I think during our process we had typical modules that had a lot more openings but we had to kind of step back uh, given the um, uh, the drying process of the clay would uh, could um, cause certain cracking if the openings were too much and also too close to each other. So we kind of scaled back uh, to be more conservative, but that's something that we want to study, especially this being more uh, of a screen wall. We wanted to, uh, we would love to test that. Um, and then continue to think about how, you know, we can really elevate both the front and the back side of the tile. So that's our team. I want to give a big shout out to our team. Uh, it was a pretty intense couple of days, but we made it happen. I also want to thank Edgar and Philippe and Saran Sanjeev who voluntarily joined our team and really made this happen. I don't know how we would have gotten here without you guys. I also want to give a special shout out to uh, some of our Henning Larson colleagues who were involved in, in, in this project. Critica Carbanda and Andrea Rivero, um, everyone who was involved, we learned a lot and thank you so much once again for this opportunity.